Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this brief ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, much of this week, we've seen this very slow-moving cutoff low that's moved through parts of the eastern Corn Belt and is right now moving through Michigan, heading to Ontario. Now, ahead of it, we've had plenty of rainfall that stretched along the coast in some places here through the Carolinas into Pennsylvania, Virginia. We've had some places that have picked up over six inches of rain. But over in parts of Indiana and Ohio and getting up to Michigan, we've also had a pocket in here of extremely heavy rainfall as well. Now, where that low currently sits is right here. And you can see, if I just kind of walk you back through the day today, it is very, very slowly moving to the north, despite the stronger winds that are surrounding it. It's been very clear, dry, and calm on the backside. And just another thing to point out here before we move away from this image, take a look at the smoke from the wildfires in Southern California. This is kind of on the, on the southern rim of the San Joaquin Valley here up against the uh, Sierra Nevada Mountains. A lot of smoke there. Now, maybe the most important thing to be taking note of on this particular animation is actually off of the animation. It's a low that's way up here and coming out of parts of uh, Manitoba and, and Saskatchewan. So Saskatchewan's here, Manitoba's there. It's gonna be the interaction between these two lows that's gonna be critical to this upcoming forecast. I'm gonna come back to that in just a few moments, but I wanted to give you kind of bigger sense here on what the month has given us so far in terms of precip. So take a moment and just pause the video and have a look at this map, which shows month-to-date precipitation ranks by climate district. And your eye can easily identify those regions that have been overly wet throughout this month, but also some places that have made some fall harvest progress, for example, right in through this area, or where it's been really quite dry and we see some drought expansion down here in the southern plains. In fact, take a look at the latest drought monitor, which was released this morning. This is an area where we've continued to see some drought expand in this region. We've had a few places in through here that have only seen brief showers and thunderstorms over the last couple of weeks. And that's why the soil moisture values down about 16 inches still remain dry in this particular part uh, of the Corn Belt. But then you get east of the Mississippi River and we've got quite a bit of saturated ground here. Whereas in the Southern Plains, getting into the High Plains, things have been drier. Now, we're going to see some changes to this in a big way next week here, but this is an area I'm expecting to say drier overall, and it's actually going to get drier farther to the east with time as well. Now, let's go take a look at what's kind of moving around and, and why I think this particular forecast has what we call a high failure mode. It has to do with the interaction between several moving pieces. The first is the cutoff low. The second is the deeper low that's coming through Canada. This one's going to come down like this. The cutoff low is going to move north. They're going to orbit around one another and end up here before they eventually move farther to the south. And that's a tricky forecast. We have to watch the deep lows that continue to come into the Pacific Northwest. I'll show you those in a few moments. And this is all complicated even further by the fact that we're watching this tropical wave right here, which was named Tropical Depression 18 yesterday, and now has the name Sam today. And Sam is moving toward the Lesser Antilles, and that's where my concern really begins to grow. Because the National Hurricane Center's afternoon update, in fact, let's just see if we got a brand new one. There we go, we got a new 5 p.m. update in here. We now see that uh, it is expected to strengthen quite quickly to become a hurricane by tomorrow, and then a major hurricane as it moves over very uh, favorable conditions, warm water, very low wind shear. And by the time we get into next Tuesday, Wednesday, this particular system is going to be sitting somewhere in this vicinity. Now, the latest European model forecast suggests that the track of this, the ensemble average, moves somewhere in here like that. But you notice there are some of the ensemble members that are farther to the south and some that are more to the north. That's a normal spread. We, of course, would prefer one of these two, but we cannot rule out the opportunity for this system to get closer and closer to the U.S. coast. And I want to explain to you what might happen in order to make that occur. So let's go straight up here and look at these pieces as they move forward over the next few days. Near-term stuff first. Here's the cutoff low that's just moving to the north into Ontario, spreading heavy rains if I kind of rock back and forth tonight uh, over parts uh, of the northeast as well. So we're going to continue to add more rain to this area as this moves north. Then you'll see here as by the time we get into Friday morning, Friday midday, and then Friday afternoon and evening, that there's another front that's advancing. It'll be about here on uh, on Friday evening, producing a band of showers and possibly some thunderstorms in this area. So it's going to move through the upper Midwest, and that's attached to that deeper low that's over parts of, like I said, Saskatchewan getting into Manitoba. So if we follow this through Saturday morning, let's just stop it at 5 a.m. The main frontal boundary will move through Michigan, stretch through Indiana and Illinois, 
and then it'll push over into this section of Ontario, which lately has gotten a lot of wet weather, cut through Ohio, bringing more uh, precipitation before exiting here. There's the low track with its front kind of cutting through the northeast. So we're going to get a brief shot at some cooler air behind this and some chances for precipitation. That's kind of piece one and two from the pieces we've been looking at. To see the other parts of this, I want to now go to a multi-model analysis looking here at the jet stream level or trough ridge pattern. So as we play this forward, what we're going to notice here is that those two troughs, there's one here and there's one there, are going to come together and it's in both models that they do this. Now I'm going to play this a little faster than I did in my in-depth forecast because what ends up occurring through early next week is a larger ridge develops behind this. A deeper trough sits over in the Gulf of Alaska. Both models agree on that. But what ends up occurring as these two troughs come together over the Canadian Maritimes is what is of interest. Because as we play this forward going out to next Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, why don't we just stop it here on October the 1st? Here's what I want you to see. By the time we work our way through that Friday, the European model takes that same load. Now remember, it started off in two pieces here and here. They eventually came together there and then made their way back down. Well, this is where it currently sits in the European and this is where it sits in the GFS. The GFS, the low is protecting the East Coast, the European, it's a bit more of an invitation for the East Coast. Now what I'm talking about there is SAM, which is here. Now the differences are where this ridge is located in both models as well. And because the GFS has the trough sitting here, the likelihood of the flow coming around the base of that trough sending what is SAM away from the East Coast is higher than in the European, where the trough sits here, the ridge sits there, and we kind of fire SAM in between the two, bringing the East Coast of the United States into play. Now, I'm not trying to hype this up or, or get you overly worried. I'm just telling you what I'm analyzing, what I'm watching. So we're going to watch it together. This is all the way out next Friday that we're talking about here. So let's keep an eye on that together. From there, let's just go look at what the next week gives us. So from now through next Thursday. And with that ridge building into the midsection of the country, we do have several dire days on tap. Deeper troughs cutting into the northwest, increased rainfall in the Cascades. And with the troughs moving through the Canadian Maritimes, the northeast does stay wet through all of this. When do we return this moisture into the uh, southern plains and high plains? Well, let me show you. High res European model, GFS is in pretty good form with this one overall, at least through the next seven days. Here we go, we've seen through Friday and Saturday, there's the week front coming through on the weekend, early weekend, and then we've got ourselves out to, let's just start this off on Monday morning. At that point, deep cyclone coming in here to British Columbia, increased rainfall in the northwest. Drier section of the country. How long does it stay that way? Well, here's out to Tuesday, into Wednesday, and even out into, let's just stop it on Wednesday night. At that point, both models bring in higher pressure here, and there's a lingering front over the Mid-Atlantic and the Carolinas, and then moisture that's being drawn up out of the Gulf, potentially producing showers and storms that race up the center plains of the United States. We also see another deep coastal low wrapping itself up into British Columbia by next Wednesday. Now from there, going into Thursday and Friday, we continue to see that high pressure cell dominate the pattern. So it's kind of the flow around it that we see the precipitation, see it? But then the European model, just watch here, this is what I want you to be focusing on. The operational run is trying to take SAM right in this vicinity. I'm gonna have to watch it carefully to see where it ends up going. Because you know what the GFS does? It pulls it way out here and then heads it up toward like Newfoundland, for example. So that's some pretty big model differences. Now. Spreading this all out and looking at the ensemble averages for week two, day 10 still favors those deeper troughs off the west coast and broad ridging across the central part of the United States. And as a result, the week two precipitation pattern favors wetter conditions coming in here, spreading around the high over parts of southern plains into the high plains, but drier east. Now, if this verifies, put a V in there, that would be fantastic for those folks who just endured all that heavy rainfall. So if I could wish cast this, I would want this particular forecast to come true. But I told you this particular forecast has a high failure mode at this point. Now we've got the next 15 days out of the way for precip. Let's talk about temperatures and we'll do a quick long range and stop. This is what happens between October 1st and October 31st. So what I'm about to show you in the forecast needs to be kind of prefaced with this. 
It's normal for the midsection of the country to cool off 18 degrees Fahrenheit on average from the 1st of October to the 31st. So let's go take a look at what those temperatures are going to do. We've already seen this. This was today. So let's see tomorrow. The cooler advances to the east, and here's our next front coming through on Friday. What's going to happen is that front pushes through on Saturday, cooling off the Great Lakes states. But the ridge begins to build in the west, and that's where the heat comes in with it. The central plains go back over to summer-like weather on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday of next week before the next trough settles into the northwest, bringing in the better chances for rainfall and the cooler conditions. But a big time warm up right here as we work our way toward the end of this month. Now, how long does that last? Well, let's go out there and look at the day five through 10. You can see the highly dynamic pattern here with almost a wave breaking ridge going up toward the Hudson Bay and the troughs that are going to try to form to the south of it. So very warm in the central plains through parts of the eastern Canadian prairie here, cooler south and east and cooler in the Pacific Northwest. And by day 10 through 15, which gets us into the month of October, the models have just washed out the pattern and left a pretty big ridge there. Now, speaking of October, let's go out and take a look at it. And to do that, I want to show you how things looked a year ago. Last year, there was a big ridge in the Gulf of Alaska, and the flow went over the top of that and then dove around a deeper trough that was sitting here over the Hudson Bay. What that gave us was a very cold center section of the United States with many of these Midwest and Northern Plain states having a top five, six, or seven coldest Octobers on records, on record, excuse me, while the Southeast and the Southwest were so warm. Precipitation wise, it was wet in through here, wet in the Southeast, dry in the Southern Plains and Central Plains, but streaks of wet in this area. Now, what are we looking at this year? Well, the latest forecast, well, let's go look at the heights first. Looks something like this for October. There's a trough here instead of what we saw last year, which was a ridge. See the difference? And if there's a trough here, okay, sorry, then the flow opens up over the rest of North America. Now, this is a long range forecast and we're just taking it for what it is. I've looked at all the teleconnections. I've looked at all of the different things that could go into this. And what I'm telling you is the models are hung up on persistence. They're just not letting go of the week two pattern. That, I'm talking about next week. They're keeping that pattern for the next month. That's why there's warmer conditions here. And take a look. Here's the 30-day precip map. It's wet where it's expected to be wet next week in these areas and drier where we're expecting it next week. The models are not picking up on the transition through October at all. And again, look at the MJO. Look at momentum. Look at the, well, let's look at La Nina. Because last year, La Nina at this time in September was cranked up very strong. This year, it's not. It's weaker. It's still La Nina, but it's about half the strength of the La Nina we had a year ago. And as a result, putting all these things together, I think October, which it is normally, is going to be a month of transition. We're going to have to watch this week by week because our long range guidance, which is what I just showed you a few moments ago, isn't offering up anything other than persistence. So I'm going to watch it. I'll report back to you again on Monday. Appreciate it. Thank you.